Good day, folks. Let's see here. Hi everyone. Just Hello. Getting used to the new interface. Yeah, I wasn't sure I was in the right place, actually. It definitely confused me. Audio check. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Steve. Okay, great. We're in the um, the customary liminal minutes. We'll come through them soon. Sounds good. So exciting that Hannes is still listed as a chair. You can still press buttons and things for us. So <laughs> I expect that to change soon. That is convenient. All right, so what is the new UI here? Okay, so join queue. I'm just, oh, and Hannes is here. Oh, I see. They have a different UX now for the queue. Yeah, it, it looks it's it's the same now as um, the conference presentation view. So you get the little ordered string of the queue in the top corner rather than in the chat pane. Nice. Okay, so we're coming up on on time. Um, I'll make my usual appeal. For somebody to help with the minutes. Uh, I can jump in. If I could find the place where the minutes are taken. Hold on. Who moved the cheese? I'll find them. Notepad for taking notes. There we go. Oh, there's a button to press. Okay. Yeah, you have to press both buttons. It's, um... Oh, the publish button. The publish button here in, in the act thing? Yeah, exactly. I got you. Okay. They have to be officially put into data tracker. And we didn't we didn't do that. So they're they're in hedge doc. They can be they can be pushed, they will be pushed, but we have to ask for special permission from um, power users at MeTeco. Oh, is there like a time limit if we don't push it yeah. in a certain time? Exactly. Okay, so published agenda for today. Uh, I think I remember, but we might as well just find it here. So status of working group last call for use cases uh, was the first one. So and working group last call has Past um, we had some some input and some some PRs. Um, I mean, Steve, Ori, you're probably in the best position. I don't know anybody else 
Um, don't know if AJ's on the call. I can't see now. Um, where are we at with the um, uh, use cases document, do you think? We clearly didn't think it was in fit state three weeks ago. We extended the call. Are, are we more confident now? Should we assign shepherds and things? <coughs> Look like you're in the queue. Uh, yep, or is in the queue. Go ahead. Uh, no. Um, at a minimum, the working group last call review should be dismissed or approved and merged. That's it. Got it. And I'll, I'll echo the same thing. We I think we last debated whether we wanted to take it with uh, the idea is frozen with the, the, we discussed that it can be updated in the future. So that kind of unblocked conversations on deferring it. So I think it's ready. Yeah. Absolutely, it makes sense. Those are open. So yeah, let's well, let's go with that. Let's say we're frozen for substantive stuff that is not currently in the uh, in the review queue. We'll accept, dismiss, and tidy up the reviews, and then see where it see where it lands. That's good. It's kind of as expected. So more onto the meat of things. Um, there has been quite a bunch of of activity, which is good uh, on the um the the regular docs um so be good appreciate it again um we're going to be leaning on the same people a lot uh, especially as hanks out but um do the editors want to give a, a an update on on where we've got two most important open issues and prs Sorry, trying to multitask multiple monitors here yeah. or multiple apps. Um, so we've been merging a bunch uh, as of recent. We've been cleaning up uh, remnants from the uh, 118 meeting. So that includes the reg info, um, cleaning that up, consolidating on the claims header. Um, there's a couple of more clears around the web that we need to complete. Um, I saw Hank's header reshuffling. I was going to validate through that this morning. Yeah. That one looked, I think there was some markdown format breaking or something at like the tool breaking with the one piece. So I was just going to fix that up today. Uh, generally speaking, I think we're in pretty good shape. We, we need to triage the list of issues because there's we've gotten them down to 18 from like 40 or so. Um, so we've been triaging those through and working through um, the, any elements that are open and left for cleanup uh, with the goal to be in a good state for adoption in 119. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that is, um, as far as I'm understanding, you know, there, there's, um, again, people can and should uh, look at the GitHub if they want to see what's going on. But um, we've got good participation on the reviews from people like Yogesh and AJ as well, uh, who are on this call. So I'll just reflect their, their participation here. So there is decent movement with a broad set of eyes. And I think what we're aiming to do is to um improve through simplification so so that consolidation on one header and and things like that is all um is all great great work from my point of view and as long as it's giving people what they need in functionality terms i think we're uh, we're actually making good progress Yeah, so into, uh, um, is it worth 
uh, this is not an invitation to do so, if not necessary, but is it worth um, discussing any of the issues or changes that might be more or less surprising? I mean, I think for people who are paying attention at 118, nothing will be surprising, but things like the claims header, um, non-mandatory reg info and stuff. Um, is it worth the chat here or should we just do all that in issues on GitHub? Okay, well, Ori, Ori's in the queue while you, while you look at that, so yeah. ask Ori. So I think um, in general, we should reserve like uh, interim call time for addressing uh, something that's a challenge or problematic. Um, if if there are topics that we want to just sort of elaborate on to create issues or because we feel <laughs> the document is weak, then I think that's a good thing to come to the mic to sort of attack that part of the document. Um, since you've <coughs> sort of kicked that off already, I'll say in the poll 139 on the architecture, I removed a lot of, uh, of text from the architecture that I think would would block it from moving forward. Um, and I, I did that in preparation for some of that text to move to Scrappy, uh, where Scrappy could kind of come in like later, you know, uh, and the architecture document could perhaps like be done sooner. So that was the intention um, there. And I'm happy to, to argue uh, for why that's a good idea if anyone wants to have, have that discussion next. Yeah, no, it's certainly not my intention to create issues. Um, yeah, much more <laughs> what you said. If there are things that um, could do with input to help the next interim bit of work, then that, that's kind of what I meant. I, yeah, not, not not looking to excite people who aren't already excited. Um, Steve? Yeah, I mean, there's, I think so that's two items. Uh, one, the, I think it's a good question of whether we want to remove the scrappy, what if, let's just call it scrappy, the scrappy section from the architecture doc before the architecture, uh, sorry, before the Scrappy API is updated, or because then we're maintaining two documents to be in sync, or do we get the architecture doc, which has the high level API calls in it, and do that on more of a lighter weight editing? And then when we're feel solid to then update Scrappy before it get and then submit for adoption. So keep it in architecture until it's updated and in sync and you know, relatively stable. Then uh, transition it over Scrappy where there's more details. That was I, the direction I thought we were going. Um, no objection to either way, it's just I worry about a little bit more work. So that's item one. Item two was the uh, other, it's a completely different topic, so I can reserve that for a separate conversation on the, where is it now? Sorry, I'm trying to find the doc. All right, no, wait, let's, let me find the other one because I'm not sure where the other one is where you're arguing for um, the registration, the person that's the, doing the registration to also be validated. Let me save that one since I'm not seeing it in the architecture doc and I forgot where it is. So let's, let's just stay focused on Scrappy for a second. What, how do we want to handle it? Do we want to just remove it all together and do all the edits in Scrappy before adoption or keep it in the architecture document? I'm in the queue, uh, but uh, since it's quiet, I'll just start talking. Um, the key mining registration PR is in the Scrappy uh, API. It's pull nine. Um, I don't really understand what you were saying uh, before. I think um, it's good to remove. I think it's good to merge 139 immediately. 
I think we've had a lot of discussion on the list and GitHub keeps history forever. And I think the working group is not going to be surprised or hurt if the architecture becomes simpler. I think actually that will help get additional reviews on the architecture. Uh, so my recommendation would be to merge pull requests. Um, in general, if I don't think a pull request is ready, I will mark it as draft or I won't raise it. That's it. I'm just giving room for others to comment whether we want to pull the APIs out altogether from IETF before we complete Scrappy. Um, so before we created the Scrappy separation, we had agreed to move the APIs out of the architecture. So that's maybe like the historic context for why did we even create Scrappy was specifically to separate it from the architecture. So I think anything we do to remove it from the architecture and improve it in its new location is in, in keeping with the original intention. Okay, so fastly iterate in the Scrappy repo is what you're recommending. Okay. With no other feedback, it seems fine. Great. And what was the second thing? I'm trying to find this way. I guess the second one was on Scrappy, is what uh, Uri said. I'm looking the straw man. Yes, it is on Scrappy API. Okay, so Uri, we can save that for a separate. Company. We can discuss it here, or do you want to start bringing Scrappy into this meeting? Since we're going to shift the conversation now. Well, Scrappy is the next agenda item, so. Um... <laughs> We could we could do that or um, uh, or not, but it sounds like there are no other nobody else on the call has strong opinions on the on the PRs and stuff going through. I think they appear to be going at a good pace, so it seems like that's all that's all fine. Cool. So Ori, floor is yours. Yeah. So I'm queued to sort of, uh, I guess, comment on poll nine in the, the Scrappy um, repo. So uh, there, with CWT claims and headers, there comes um, special claims that have uh, signif significance and, and meaning. And one of the things to consider, and actually we discussed this like way, way, way back at the beginning when Skit was first forming, um, it's not a perfect analogy, but um, whenever you have JWT or CWT or signers and verifiers, issuers and verifiers, there's always a question of, is this the two-party model or a three-party model scenario? So just a quick sort of summary, like the two-party model, you have an issuer and a verifier. The issuer always prepares signed data for the verifier. The issuer will identify the verifier using the audience claim, uh, usually, and then the issuer will uh, sign data that's intended to be verified by the verifier. So that's two parties, right? In the three-party model, uh, the issuer doesn't know who exactly is going to verify what they're signing. Um, and that's an important privacy and security characteristics for some use cases, like particularly digital identity credential use cases where, you know, you don't want the Department of Motor Vehicle to know every time you try and buy beer at a gas station. So um, if Skit has a, a use case for um, registering a, a credential that was issued by some original issuer, but presented by an integrator. Uh, so, you know, for example, perhaps there is a first issuer who uh, signs um, a certain kind of firmware, 
and then they issue credentials for that. And then later they hand those credentials to a distributor who signs that they've integrated um, that software with another package. In that second case, when that second party registers, they can prove that they hold a public key material that the original first issuer was aware of. That's called the uh, key binding, you know, in, in OAuth terminology, um, it's making use of this confirmation claim, which is a publicly known registered claim name that's relevant to JWT and CWT. So in the case where Skit would want for the party that's registering to, instead of being the original issuer, to be a holder of a credential, then we would need to be aware of these confirmation claims and their behavior. I'm very interested in this use case. This is actually our use case. Um, like, so, you know, as I've said before, we came to work on things at Skit because we care about physical supply chain use cases. And we think a lot of the technology that Skit is, is developing for software supply chains is relevant to physical supply chain. And in physical supply chains, we have these scenarios where you have credentials and they're related to digital twins of products. And sometimes the party that's registering a claim, making you know a signed statement transparent, isn't the original issuer, but is instead a holder of a credential that the original issuer had provisioned to them. So uh, we very much like to see Scrappy account for uh, whatever endpoints need to support these uh, key binding or you know interactive or non-interactive presentations. Um, it's not to say that the two-party model is like is isn't the only thing that you need in securing a software supply chain. It's just that we know the three-party model exists and is popular now. And I think, given that Scrappy is being built at this time, it would make sense for us to account for uh, the three-party model in the design of Scrappy. That's it. So the scenario that you're discussing, or sorry, I jumped in because I saw my names in the queue next. Did you want to say something, John? Uh, uh, only to thank Ori for, for such a great topic. Otherwise, no, carry on. Yeah, I was going to say, so it, it, I think it, it really is interesting, especially the whole driver's license or any of those scenarios where you're trying to not have disclosure of information leak beyond its intent um, makes perfect sense. What I was trying to answer, what I was mentioning it on the RBAC question on Slack was the a scenario that I typically think of is within the software cases, a, a vendor, you know, pick Adobe, pick Microsoft, pick anybody, IBM, doesn't matter, distributes some software or some component, and then another one makes it part of their software. So they're registering the use. So a, a, an issuer issues a statement around the software that they've built and made statements around its quality and so forth. I then want to, as an, another software company says, I'm going to consume that. They're not, all they're saying is they're putting that software into their system, they're registering it on their skit service to say that I am consuming this this software from this third party. The is that person's identity supposed to be part of that mm -hmm. system as well? Or is that just a matter of I'm taking a driver and putting it into my system? The person that actually puts it in is not as important as, as the identity of the driver itself. So that's what I'm trying to get my head around is why does the person that's registering the statement need to be captured in skit as opposed to that's just an RBAC call. Do I have rights to be able to write to it as opposed to my identity needs to be captured as well? So is it optional or required? I guess is my, my question, Ori. Awesome, Steve. I tried to capture what you asked in the in the notes, so you should make sure it's sort of close to what you were trying to ask. Um, our back is an orthogonal concept here, uh, so it sort of 
it feels like it's related, but, but um, you know, with RBAC, that's about who has permission to invoke a write operation and it implies authorization in some way. Um, when you're talking about uh, presentations of credentials with confirmation, the holder is proving that they are still in possession of a key that the original issuer uh, assigned to them or, or, you know, bound their credential. And then they can push that presentation in a channel they're authorized to push presentations in. So there is a difference in the meaning um, between giving a credential, registering just a regular signed statement and registering a signed statement while proving possession of a key. And you can do both of those things in many different channels with different authorization schemes and RBAC could be a part of those authorization schemes. So they're separate, totally separate concepts. Um, you asked, uh, you know, why does it matter uh, that the transparency service might understand that the party making a registration isn't you know, the original issuer, but instead is an integrator role. That's kind of, um, Unless, unless we, unless we describe that this is a thing that can happen, I think uh, the transparency service wouldn't have any way of sort of acknowledging anything other than the two-party model. And so, uh, as a transparency service operator, my registration policy could require every signed statement to come with confirmation binding in a really high security scenario for certain use cases that could be a thing that ev literally every signed statement always comes with and there has to be key binding and it has to be fresh and and that's that's a use case uh you know for some scenarios that might be out there another transparency service could have a different policy and they could say you know it's optional it's not mandatory but when present i do understand it and another one might say, uh, I'll, I won't accept anything with key binding. It's my policy that I just don't care about that and I don't want to receive that information and I'm not gonna make, in particular, I'm not gonna make presentations transparent. I'm only gonna make signed statements transparent. And I, I recognize I'm kind of using some language here that maybe not everyone is familiar with, but when you have these binding, uh, signed statements with binding, there's a cryptographic difference between just giving that token and giving that token while proving possession of a key. And it's good to use different words to describe those two different things because you get different security properties by mandating uh, one or the other. Um, so I, I think it's a policy. I think it's on the edge of, uh, you know, what we're chartered to even sort of talk about with the scrappy API. Like we, we said, we wanted to keep the policy layer kind of not in scope. We're not writing specific policies, but we did say we have this one minimal policy where we want to authenticate the issuer. And it doesn't make sense to say authenticate the issuer when you're dealing with a confirmation bound credential, because what you are trying to do is actually authenticate the holder and the issuer, not just the issuer. That's it. Thanks, sorry. I think you addressed my thing. What, my two questions. Like one, I, I agree that a bunch of it is RBAC, which is out of scope, so um, makes perfect sense. But what and you're saying is that this is an optional piece for registration policies to use, which is awesome because it enables exactly the kind of workflows that you're talking about. But it doesn't require um, every promotion of content from one skip service to another to be disclosed on the second, the person that's actually putting a statement on that could just be some automated system that's promoting content. So I, I think it addresses a bunch of questions. I, and I really love the scenario. I love the ability to be able to capture that as optional information for exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I wanted to just um, pop in as well, because I noticed a few, a few folks who are missing from the call who were with us in uh, in former times but i'm quite sure i've heard strong support for um you know delegated authorities of one kind or another which this also um allows if we don't have a capability like this then 
that kind of delegation of I'm signing software on behalf of somebody else or you know my my VRF that's actually been signed by the person who audited my processes rather than me myself or you know all those, all of these things um, that have that have been voiced in the past as as use cases for the software supply chain if we don't code that into the spec then the only place to implement that will be in the discretionary policy of the transparency service itself which is of course exactly the wrong place for you to do your uh, identity management so i think it seems to me like um, this is a, a great idea to unlock some of the use cases that that we do have in scope i don't think it's really pushing the edges um, of, of scope in this case sorry because um, those are those not in your technical terms but those requirements i think i've heard from this this community quite quite frequently Steve, is your hand vestigial now? Shall we let Ray in? Yeah. Uh, Ray, go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, you've been completely under 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 the gun on some other things, so I haven't been able to <laughs> really look at this much. But I wanted to say on this point that this sounds like there's actually two parts of this delegation. One part is where you are. Uh, where, which is what uh, was just being described by Ori, <clears throat> where you have a um, sort of a, a, an entity which has the power to sit, to approve, to, um, you know, uh, give the stamp of approval on some other entity and say, this entity has the stamp of approval. And, and so it's not the entity that's giving it that we're, 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 you know, stamping, but they're, they're probably the one doing the work so the entity um so there's so th that's like what you're saying like somebody says okay i want to apply for a driver's license the dmv says okay uh i'm going to send your driver's license in uh to skit to have it be stamped i'm just taking this case not saying it's important uh but the dmv is not the but the dmv in this case is saying okay this entity is now that i'm just now blessing now has i'm bestowing kind of like my um authority onto it and now it has some kind of authority okay then there's a second type where and that's like the first half of a delegation in my view so the first half of the delegation is where you say this entity has has some some trait that i'm i have the authority to give to it and then once that entity has that authority, then it can do something else. It could probably come back in the in the larger case and say, OK, now I have the authority to also submit things to Skit based on the first, you know, blessing that I got from this first entity. And that would be more like what we see in the software case of it, of a place like, let's say, um, you know, first come to mind Microsoft, right? They have so many people there. But then you have to say, okay, well, this person, I'm going to delegate my authority to them to be able to submit stuff to Skit. And that would be the first step. And then once that person or group or whatever it is has that authority bestowed to them, then they could then submit to, to Skit. So then, then you would have the full, full delegation. It sounds like what you're talking about here is only the first step. Anyway, that's my reflection on it. Thank you. And, and by the way, while I still still have the floor here, um, I would like uh, to suggest that we not try to close down the, um, the use cases so quickly because I think, from my experience anyway, they're almost the thing that's written last, even though you'd like to write them first. Um, and, um, and, and because of that. So, and also I see, I've seen that that in the last, I don't know, few months, uh, the various concepts that we've been discussing have have changed somewhat, and um, and they may still be changing. I I have a feeling that we're not in a mode yet where we can actually uh, say that that is done, and so I would like it to be if we're going to to be um, you know taking a last call or something. 
uh, would be like a preliminary version uh, and make sure that that's known uh, because I don't think that we can say it's going to be the final version at this time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ray. It's good, good input. And just on a point of process, I mean, we, we always can update these things. The last call doesn't say this is the final edit. It says this is a complete version which kind of agrees with itself and is worth reading. So we can we can do both of those things. But I think um, in any case, as we observe, we're not we're not in the second stage uh, yet either. So we're going to have to have to do a bit more bit more tinkering there. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, I, and yeah, I think um, if nobody else wants to answer your point, I I would agree with your um your characterization there and i think there's the second step that you just defined kind of overlaps with steve's our back comment which is as already said orthogonal so i think we're um we're dancing around the same totem pole on that one well i don't know so much that it's orthogonal um and maybe when in terms of saying that it's our back like the full machine of our back might be mm -hmm. uh, uh outside this you know what we want to talk about but the the actual like interaction with it in terms of these delegations at the at the very moment when they when they talk to it would be uh would be norothargal and and also it, it also broaches a question about uh whether uh, you know, the identity question, how, how the identity is handled and so forth, and is, is Skit handling that? And then, then it would be not orthogonal to, but it would actually be right on top of what maybe RBAC does. I'm not sure. I'm not so much role-based. Role-based um, is kind of a little bit further away from this by defining those roles and so forth that we're not going to really, we're not going to have a part in that, that part of the, that machine. But but the very end of, of the first delegation of saying, here's a party that I want to use my grand authority to say is good. And that's one step that sort of Ori, I think, was describing. And then the second step is when that entity, and this is what Ori, I don't think, was Lee putting in. Because in most of those cases that I think are in that sort of personal attribute uh, thing of, of getting a driver's license or a diving certificate or something, uh, you don't have really an authority to do anything with Skit from then on. You just have the authority in the outside world to use that certificate, and then they can check back. But the, the next step is for those parties that the delegation actually is with regard to Skit. And so then, it, instead of being a, the d diver's license, uh, of, you know, diving certificate, of you, you, can, you have the authority to dive, uh, then you would instead say you have the authority to come back and use Skit. Um, but doesn't get into roles or anything else. It was just a very small, uh, and I just wanted to bring that up. Um, and I, gee, I really like this new interface. <laughs> this is the first time I've seen this new, uh, <laughs> new, you know, meet echo thing. It's wonderful. Thank you. I feel like I should minute that as well. <laughs> I'll send it over to the Meteco team. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. Ori's added it to the minutes. Um, great. Okay. So it sound I I think it sounds like um, there is um, essentially. I mean, on all the topics, it sounds like the PRs and the motivations that are live are are in the interest of the of the group. So I guess we carry on. That sounds um, sounds very positive, Ori. To to your question, um, as well as uh, as well as the direction of taking skit, so uh, scrappy. So go ahead, Eric. I'm I'm not sure if we've covered the agenda item, but I wanted to you know perhaps throw onto the agenda for discussion in case there's time. Um, this discussion around uh, JSON encoding of Seabor. Uh, uh, in in Scrappy, because I think um, that's been an area where there's been some a lot of discussion, and it seemed to be positive support for doing some of that. Um, but you know, we'll have to 
make some changes to get there. And so in case some um, folks wanted to talk about the way that they were hoping to see Seabor and Cozy payloads uh, exchange this JSON, um, if we wanted to discuss that, I think that might be also a good thing to chat about in the higher bandwidth. That's it. Yeah, good point. So I think we're, we're the agenda as as stated is done. I think there's no controversy on the PRs, so we we carry on with those. Um, so yeah, so for um, I'll take my chair hat off for a second for this one, um, just to make things easier. Representing a company that happens to write software for a living, um, the experience of implementing. Uh, the, the API in general and receipts and, and everything else has been very interesting. We've written two and a half now uh, with, with my team uh, in my company of these things. And the experience every time seems to be that the cozy Seabor for representing the actual signed statements and receipts and the things that we store is great um, coming from a team that's been writing ASN1 for the last 25 years, we're very happy to be dealing with something like Seaboard, which is at least better than that. Um, so no, no squabble at all with Cozy Seaboard as the general thing for generally being used and generally specifying the absolute um, form and interoperability of, of the data structures. The question arises with the REST API specifically, that of course REST APIs are past across networks through different types of devices through different library stacks through different parsers and interpreters and different gateways and things and stuff and there's an awful lot of machinery in the way that behaves in more or less nice ways with binary application types um, and so in order to deal with that and make fast progress and kind of safe robust progress um, team in my company has i think every time defaulted to base 64 encoding everything before it goes across the wire um so again all of the stored values all the interaction and and everything else up until the point it becomes a a, a rest api payload is is in cozy and seymour but then you package it up into a nice json dictionary uh, and all of the awkward bits are packaged up as nice base 64 encoded strings uh, and that's been a really convenient way of getting the, the data from one end in a client that knows what it's doing to the other end in the transparency service that knows what it's doing without the bits in the middle potentially getting in the way or, or messing with it. So that's the, the general topic. And I think you know, three, three things to say and see if anybody has any um, thoughts on the matter. So one is that um, the data trails implementation now passes Seabor across the across the interface. You know, it's not impossible. Uh, it's been done, um, but it does make it difficult to use standard tooling. Um, two is we could consider not defining the REST API as the canonical one uh, and define some other protocol, or we could consider saying that the REST version takes all of this other great Seabor cozy um but in order to be interoperable with the client you have to package it up into a nice json dictionary with base 64 encoded things all, all three of these are fine we happen to have found the last of those was the most convenient uh so there you go uh Ori? yeah i basically want to uh, agree with everything you just said um in the implementations we've done we've also found it really beneficial to encode the request and responses as JSON, and then to include in them uh, base 64 URL encoded um, binary messages uh, in the case that you have to post uh, something to the server or you have to get something from the server. Having the text armoring around the binary makes the API really easy to specify. And then that makes it so that it's really easy to generate SDKs and code examples from the API specification itself. So um, I'm a, 
we had previously discussed, you know, how many different media types might be relevant to uh, the sort of skit um, API. And I think um, it would make a lot of sense, especially for resources that are expressing a collection, um, for those collections to be JSON um, encoded resources. And I think at this point, we should be looking, starting to look at uh, maybe specifying some media types for JSON encodings that are specific to Skit. And um, using those JSON encodings as a way of being explicit about the content type uh, that, that we're returning from the requests. And then if there is a, also a desire to have Scrappy support direct binary dereferencing, then we, we should also make it clear that we're preserving those capabilities or that you can negotiate for a pure binary in the case that JSON is the default. So I think we're to the point now where it's probably time to start um, making unique media types and talking about what is the default and when can you negotiate for a different representation. That's it. Yeah, sounds, sounds exactly the same. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, dealing with additional media types is also a, an interesting an interesting thing that I think we don't need to get into to publish a useful first version. So um, good. Ray? Uh, quick question, if you don't mind. The reason we're using the uh, you know binary encoding, can, can we just cover that? Like, why? Uh, why do we need the CBOR block inside the JSON? Of course, we could maybe express a lot of the stuff in JSON just um, using the regular, you know, JSON syntax. So, uh, what what is that reason? It's probably simple to answer that. I hope um, is it is it because we need something that is uh, not going to have any variation of of syntax um you know that you might that might come up in a json block such as you know spaces and whatever the, the variations might be uh, you know new lines etc or is that is that it as simple as it is thank you yeah i'm uh cute to answer um so basically uh with skit we're defining um, these two sort of envelope formats, these are the messages that go in, you know, you send a signed statement to a transparency service, you get a receipt. Um, we want those to be binary because we want them to be as small as possible. Inside of them, there could be content that is XML or JSON or whatever that's valuable in the software supply chain scenario. We, we know that Software supply chains have lots of media types that need to be secured. So we built uh, signed statements and receipts so that cozy envelope could wrap any of the relevant uh, software supply chain media types, but that you'd have the extensibility and tooling support that comes from using the cozy envelope structure. And we had options. We could have done a hosy envelope structure, but then we would have uh, been stuck with JSON, and JSON has some size issues that, you know, if you're building a, something today, I think probably it'd be better to start building on Cozy than Hosey, personally. Um, but, you know, I do a lot of work in both of them. We have ASN1, we could have picked that as well, I think, for similar reasons. Building on top of Cozy uh, makes a lot more sense for us. Um, and then, you know, we could have said, well, you know, we're going to support all of them and then that would be bad for interoperability. So the reason we made these decisions is that they're important to a good design. There should be only one way to create a signed statement and it should be with by implementing a already well known and you know, battle tested standard. That's why we use cozy sign one. There should be um, support for securing 
media types that are critical to software supply chains, and we have that with the data structure today. Um, the Skit API should avoid basically forcing implementers to have deep knowledge and understanding of multiple media types. Um, and the Skit API should also have good support for off-the-shelf tooling and other API design standards. Um, and that's a place where JSON's, JSON support seems to be important in order to get good adoption and implementation. So it's really just a, you know, it's about, you know, the design. Um, good design means limiting the number of choices and making good mandatory to implement um, decisions. That's it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, really helpful, Orion. I think that will, the interoperability thing obviously is massively, massively key, and we don't want to proliferate with a million options. Um, Yogesh, welcome. Yeah. Yogesh. Um, are we saying that um, at the API level, we want to construct a JSON payload at the request response? Is that what is agreed? Which Where we will wrap the envelope, cozy envelope, cozy sign one in there before sending it? Or may I misrepresented it or misunderstood it? I think Ari's going to answer you. Yeah. So um, I I don't know um, the answer. The, the proposal that I sort of was floating was to define acceptable media types that the API will uh, yep. will support. So you know, and then there's request and response side. So as a yep. client sending data to a transparency service, I should use the content type to explain the data format that I'm sending. So I could say, hey, I'm sending you JSON encoded Seabor as a client. And the server would say, yep, that's content that I understand. And I will return to you JSON encoded Seabor. Or the server could say, I understand you're sending me JSON encoded Seabor, but I'm going to send you Seabor back because we only send Seabor back. Um, the, the point being that in the API specification, we can make these really clear at the request response boundary. And we have to do that both in the API spec and then also in the normative text that goes with the API spec. Um, and what's mandatory? Uh, what's the default? Those are questions that I think we should explain what the default is. The default should be mandatory to implement. And then in the case that you want uh, a better user experience, or you want to do some optional alternative encodings for your implementation, if there's enough consensus to document those, we should document them. And then there'll be interoperability around understanding them. I think from where I'm sitting, I'm actually, I would be tending to make the default JSON. Um, mm -hmm. That might be controversial, but I think yes. that doing that would uh, potentially help with the adoption of the skit API itself, and then and that in turn will help with the adoption of the cozy envelope formats. But um, the main reason I say that is just like the API tooling. Like if you try and put cozy content types and media types into an API specification tool, almost every API spe specification tool that I've tested doesn't understand cozy at all. And so all the off the shelf code generation isn't going to work all of these other interface issues are, are going to be sort of problematic. And we would just be sort of, we would be publishing an API document knowing that that was all happening. I think that's bad design. Um, even if you know, we would have preferred to have just said, Cozy and Seabor are the mandatory to support ones, yep. but uh, JSON is optional. I, for the API, I would say JSON's mandatory and, and Seabor is optional. How about if we, I mean, I, I kind of understand the sentiment behind it, but I don't necessarily kind of agree the approach you are taking. Uh, JSON, yes, JSON is helpful, but I think the fundamental should be the way we have encoded COSE and uh, uh, COSE sign one and the CBOR was our fundamental encoding. So that should be the minimum required. And if need be, we should provide the right tooling to build those kind of COSE sign one envelopes where any anybody can encode a given document 
given issuer statements into that that kind of tooling might help the cause and then we can add optionality of json on top of that as option two but uh, making it the mandatory thing i'm not sure about that i'm not very convinced we should do that and that's all i had yeah thank you um I'm, I'll, I'll respond briefly uh i'm i'm actually fine if we say it's the the scrappy api mandatory content types are always cbor and then optionally you can do the json encoding and we define the json encoding i'm fine to do that um i i think you know just from a tooling perspective um yeah i I think from a tooling perspective, it, you know, most implementers are going to want that optional JSON one, but I'd be fine saying Seabor is mandatory. Um, doesn't doesn't bother me. That's it. Okay, <clears throat> let me make a suggestion, um, and and this may what I'm fine. What I think was going to be pretty essential is to first of all, I I support JSON um, at, uh, a lot. Um, <clears throat> now, if you're going to have a wrapper around something, then it should be like, if possible, a minimal wrapper that says, I'm just a wrapper and here's the version of the whatever I have inside and here's what it is and that's it. Um, now, if, if what's inside is another piece of JSON, then that that's fine. It just continues to work down. Um, if it's Seabor, I think it's pretty essential to have that wrapper because from, from just a developmental standpoint, you're going to have people have to look at these and see what they are. And if it's just a chunk of um, base 64 encoded uh, blob uh, or not uh, just a Seabor thing, then you need some other tool to have to read it. And, um, you know, those may not be available yet. So certainly Jason has a lot of tools available for anything a browser can read it. So you'll be able to just look at it and say, okay, there's, it's just text. So you could, you could, you could say, here's the version, here's what's inside. And there's a, there's a chance for development to sort of shortcut some of the extra steps you'd have to take. And then if it's Seabor, <clears throat> uh, um, I'm not an expert on these things. I know I, I used to use ASN one long time ago, but the, uh, and I didn't have a problem with it. I just, you know, I, I know there's maybe some nuances they, they don't like, um, to me, it's just, I don't care like how it's encoded as long as there's a decoder and encoder. Uh, but, um, you know, to not have to go through those. So pretty much, I think anything that we come up with should have, uh, and this is what I'm trying to do also with any kind of development I'm doing is, is to have a first level wrapper around any JSON that says, here's what's inside here. And then the next thing is whatever that thing is so that we can keep version numbers. We can have what like you say yeah we like it this way we want to have seabor inside and then someone later says you know what that that wasn't a good idea uh what we're finding is that the blah 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 about seabor so we need to change it and then they can version it up and say okay from now on we're going to make this the the main thing um it's it's a tricky thing to decide like what is going to be you know, we want certainly we want number one not too many options so that that we we've you know, we have to develop a bunch of crap to, to handle all the options for readers. Um, but then again, we want some flexibility in case we need to make changes. Thank you. Great. Well, yeah, so I think that that question of the of the tool support and adoption is the big one. Uh, and that, that's that's where that comes from. So um, if you know, anyone who's interested and in, um, doing that, thank you, Ori, um, particularly for your contributions today. Um, anyone who's interested, uh, that will be evolving in the Scrappy repo, and we all have access to the issues and PRs. So um, we'll develop that over the next month and uh, hopefully get something ready. Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Good job. And nice, nice interface. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>